There was one line in there that he came to bring peace to all the nations. Uh, and that's something that we'll experience next Sunday morning. I do want to uh, invite you, Mark already talked about next Sunday, where we will gather um, on Christmas morning with, our, with the Korean church, Mandarin church, uh, Common Ground, which is a, a mixture of Japanese American and then us. And we'll be singing Christmas carols in Korean, Mandarin, uh, English. So it'll be a fun service. Uh, I kind of see it as that, that a picture maybe of that first Christmas when we're all together in heaven, every tribe and tongue and nation. So consider being here for Christmas Day as well as Christmas Eve uh, next Saturday. So just a great weekend. Uh, look, so looking forward to it. So I didn't get a chance to welcome, if you're online, uh, welcome. Thanks for being part of our service. Uh, my name is Doug Boyd. I have the privilege of serving as uh, pastor here at Parkside Fellowship. Thanks for those of you that prayed for Rose and I uh, last weekend as we were uh, back in Denver uh, with some meetings with the Calvary family of churches. Just a great time uh, back there and I have a lot of uh, exciting information and news to share with you. Uh, but thanks for your prayers because we, we almost didn't make it out. We weren't sure. Tuesday, the, the, the storm that hit, the big Midwest storm, uh, hit just east of us. In fact, we're driving to the airport and there was a sign that said, uh, I-70 closed from Airway Boulevard to Kansas, <laughs> right? Basically, you couldn't get east of the airport uh, to Kansas, so uh, they de-iced our plane and we made out, so appreciate your prayers. Well, it is. It's Christmas, right? One week from today, uh, we will celebrate the birth of Jesus. What I want to do this morning, though, I want to take you back 2,000 years ago to that first Christmas to the lives of both Joseph and Mary. When this, this teenage couple that was preparing to get married, when they're wor- married, married, their world was turned upside down. I mean, think about it. this. This was a young couple that were so looking forward to getting married, becoming husband and wife, right? They were in that courtship phase with, that goes along with that and Planning, Mary's, I'm sure, just trying to figure out how am I gonna, how am I gonna, you know, plan this wedding, and and Joseph's trying to figure out, okay, do I do I make enough of the carpenter to to raise a family, and they're gonna establish a home, and they've they've got life ahead of them, they've made plans. I mean, I think we forget that these were two kids, young kids, in the throes of beginning a family, and then just like that, there was a divine interruption. God stepped in. And so what had been a loving, joyful, hope-filled journey in the lives of Mary and Joseph all of a sudden became filled with fear, doubt, accusations, questions about, you know, should, should we go through with this marriage? For, for, for these two, I'm sure the visit by the angel that said, hey, you're about to become parents of the Messiah, Emmanuel, God in the flesh, was anything but peaceful. For them, the birth of Jesus was not peace on earth, goodwill towards men. I I just imagine it was just the opposite. Again, with suspicion surrounding the the pregnancy of Mary as she began to show. Joseph with with this, this angst in the pit of his stomach trying to figure out, okay, do I, do I marry her? Do I not marry her? What do I do? Mary thinking, I don't, I'm, first of all, I'm not ready to be a mother. Number one. Number two, I don't think I'm ready to be the mother to the Messiah, right, to the Son of God. And so they've got all this, all these, these things, these emotions whirling around in their mind. Their, their world had gone from peaceful, hopeful, to unnerving, to feelings of fear and fear frustration and doubt and confusion it was anything but peaceful this morning I had an opportunity to experience doubt confusion pain as I'm walking as I'm walking uh, around out in the lobby trying to get things ready and I know the sound the uh, band in here practicing all of a sudden I hear this loud squealing I'm thinking what in the world's going on and so I look out and all I see out here between the 
the sanctuary and the parsonage, the house next door, is a cloud of smoke. And I just glance out, and there is this Camaro just doing donuts. I mean, just, uh, you see, you know how big that space is right there? He's doing donuts between this and the sanctuary. And so I ran out there okay, just as he was squealing out, driving it, and going down. And so uh, there were t- people across the street, three individuals, two guys and a gal, and they, were, they had been filming it. And so um, my, uh, my inner guy took over. Okay, I'll just say that. My inner guy took over, and I was not happy. I was not a happy camper. I did not in that moment display the love of Jesus. We'll just say that. As I grabbed my cell phone and started to call Washington County Sheriff. And the guy knew exactly what I was doing. And so he just, he just launched into this tirade of words that I will not share from the stage. But you can just imagine. So I'm on this side. He's across the street in the apartment complex. And he's screaming at me. And again, my inner guy took over. And I'm like, I don't care what you think. Whether I should call the police. Right? So I'm like confession time right now. Right? I just, yeah, there was very few, there was very, very little Jesus in me in that moment. As we're, as we're heatedly having this conversation across Erickson Avenue. And so finally, okay, I, you know, he started walking and started crossing Erickson Avenue. And his, he's telling me to walk away. And of course, I'm a guy, I don't walk away. So I stood my ground. I'm like, okay, here we go. What's going to happen? And so he gets to me, and, and I could tell you could smell the alcohol from a mile away. And so he begins to share with me that just 14 hours earlier, his brother had taken his own life with a 357. And his brother was a street racer. And so they were filming this seen if you've ever fast and furious all that's a movie maybe you haven't seen okay famous movie there's like nine of them right they were filming this scene in our parking lot in honor of his brother who had taken his own life because he was a street racer he was in the street racing scene and so he's sharing this with me and he then talks about the fact that he he's religious okay he's got he's got rosary beads coming down and so i'm religious but I, I, I don't go to church, right? I don't go to church. I'm, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm religious because my mom was religious, but I don't practice it. I don't practice anything. And he, he's sharing this story with me. As he's searching for an answer to the question why, right? Why did my brother take his own life? And I know, he said, I know churches are, are supposed to be welcoming right? Not judging, right? Welcoming, spreading love. And so I I know this, and so I'm trusting that you're not going to judge us. And I said, well, this wasn't about judgment. This was about safety. I I wasn't judging you or even the person in the car. This was about trying to figure out if someone whipped into our parking lot while you're doing donuts. Man, there's an accident waiting to happen. But we began to talk more and more. And I left him with just this simple statement that I, I said, I, Carlos, I know you're looking for peace. I, I get it, right? You're hurting right now. You're confused. You're not sure what to do. And you know the answer to all of that is God. I know he talked about many religions. I said, yeah, many religions, one God. I'm not going to get into the religious debate right now. Let's just talk about God. I said, I would love to share with you more about him maybe when you're a little more sober. So I gave him a couple bottles of water, a little book, sent him on his way. Whether Carlos comes back, I don't know. But as as I'm walking back into into the church, I'm thinking, man, there, (laughs) there was a moment right there, where someone needed peace, in search of peace, both inner peace and external peace, right? Because there's, there's both of those struggles going on, the inner peace of, of a shattered heart, 
and the external peace of a shattered family. And there's maybe even some in this room who are also dealing with that, who are dealing with some inner struggle, uh, maybe a lack of peace for whatever reason that may have an external situation uh, uh, tied to it. I mean, peace is, peace is something that, that we, we look at and we, we, we just sang about it and we read about it, right, in Luke 2. And we begin to wonder, maybe you wonder, and I'm sure Carlos wonders, where is the peace in, in, in what, the, what the, you know, the, the choir of angels that they sang to a group of shepherds on a hillside watching their sheep? They promised peace. Where is it? Right, we just saw on the screen, Jesus came to bring peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Where? Right? Where's this peace that, the, that we talk about during the Christmas season? I'll tell you where it's found for many people. <laughs> it's found on your local television set. Right? During this time of year more than any other, right? The, the TV executives, the networks, they want us to feel some peace, to feel some comfort, to feel some joy as we watch Ralphie go on this no-holds-barred search for the Red Ryder BB gun. Right? The Red Ryder BB gun that Santa Claus, his mom, his friends all say, I get you that, you're going to put your eye out. Right? And the joy that we see in Ralphie is he opens up the greatest gift a nine-year-old boy could ever receive, the BB gun. The, the networks want us to believe the peace is found as we watch the Grinch whose heart grew three sizes that day. Right, Ebenezer Scrooge, who went from mean old man to cheerful giver. And maybe the ultimate picture of peace that we all, I think, would raise our hand and admit we, we, we're, we're captivated during this time of year. And that is anything, anything at all that's on the Hallmark Channel. Right, the Hallmark Channel Christmas. That is, that is where you find love and joy and peace. During this time of year. And it, and, and it is, right? We, we watch those movies, we watch those cartoons over and over and over again. We watch Frosty the Snowman because it makes us feel good. Because even tempor- for in a temporary moment, it, it, you know, we're able to put aside all the pain and frustration, whatever's going on in our lives, because we're watching Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer conquer the abominable snowman. I mean, just, just all, whatever whatever movie or cartoon or show that you watch at Christmas time is designed to help us feel the joy and the peace of Christmas. And, it, it, and for many it works. Temporarily it works. It, and, and it works because in Ecclesiastes we read that God made everything beautiful in its time, and he has also set eternity in the human heart. God designed us. He designed us to be humans that long for, that have a deep desire for love, joy, peace. It doesn't matter if you're Christian, atheist, Buddhist, Hindu. In fact, Carlos told me he's been in all of those. He's been Catholic, Hindu, Buddhist. He's in search of He's in search of peace and love and joy and un- unconditional forgiveness. And some people are able to find it at least for 31 days on the Hallmark Channel. But those of us that have a relationship with God, we know, we, we know that that's a, a, that only satisfies temporarily. Because what, what many people are doing is they're searching for a kingdom. They're searching for a place to belong, but they're searching for that without Jesus. They're searching for a kingdom without the king. They're searching without the prince of peace. So the question I want to address this morning, the question that Carlos and I addressed for 20 minutes in the parking lot this morning, was, is peace even possible? Right, these, angel, these angels are saying peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Is that even attainable? Can I actually experience peace in the world we live in? 
with the confusion in our world, with the violence in our world, with the, with the division in our world. How can we possibly experience peace? Well, hopefully this morning and again next Saturday, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day as we celebrate the birth of Jesus, you'll discover the answer to that question, if you don't already know it, is yes. Peace is possible because Jesus, the birth of Jesus, it ushered in an opportunity for peace. I want us to know that this Christmas, peace has a name. That love has a name. Joy has a name. Hope has a name. And his name is Jesus. Peace is found in the manger. Peace is found in Jesus. So how can I experience that? If you have your Bibles, go to Ephesians 2. Not your typical Christmas passage, I know. But Ephesians chapter 2. Because in Ephesians 2, the Apostle Paul is going to address peace. And when, as he addresses peace, he's going to address hostility. He's going to address division. He's going to address hatred. While addressing peace through Jesus. So let me pray for us, and then we'll dive in here to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 13, but let me, let me pray for us. God, I can't help but in this moment pray for Carlos, his family. Lord, as they are confused, they're hurt, they're angry at the loss of their brother. And the circumstances behind him taking his own life. Lord, I, I pray that in this moment... God, you would reveal yourself to this family. That they would see you as more than just a religious figure. God, but as the creator, God. Sovereign God, loving God. Who sent his son Jesus to come and to die for our sins. God, may that, be, may that become known to Carlos and his family. Lord, just reveal to us now, God, as we study your word. God, reveal to us your peace. Lord, we pray all these sayings in Jesus' name. Amen. So Ephesians 2, verse 13. We read, these are Paul, Paul writes, But now, in Christ Jesus, you, who were once far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself, that's Jesus, is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of two thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to god through the cross by which he put to death their hostility he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. Jesus came both to preach peace and to bring peace. Now, as, 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 when I first read this passage, I said, okay, I, how, where, what can I learn from that? I mean, yeah, it talks about peace, but it also talks about division and hostility. Talks about the law and the commands. What, what, what's Paul getting at here? What does Paul want us to understand? Well, in order to understand what Paul's talking about, we need to understand the context of this passage. You can't just look at a couple verses that talk about peace and say, okay, I get it. I, know, I now know where, where peace is found. You've got to dive in and understand the context. And what we have here is the second of Paul's two famous contrasts. That are found here in chapter 2. Go, go back to verse 4. Back to verse 4 of chapter 2. Paul's going to talk about the first contrast. It says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Right? The contrast is this. Even though we were once dead because of our sin, right? We were lost because of our sin. We were separated from God because of our sin. But now, right, the first words of verse 4, but now because of his great love, because of God's love, 
we have an opportunity to be made right with God. Even though we, you know, we, we maybe used to live our lives where we followed the world and satisfied our own, you know, cravings of our own desire, right? Even then, God didn't abandon us. Even though Carlos is still searching for, God hasn't abandoned him. God's there for us. We have the opportunity because of Jesus to experience forgiveness. We have the opportunity to be in a right relationship with God. Uh, drop down to verse 8 there. Okay, famous verses. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is a gift. Right? Christmas. It's a season to give gifts. We've been given the greatest gift known to man. Jesus. Right? It's a gift. Salvation. It's a gift. Not by works so that no one can boast. Our opportunity to experience peace is not up to us. It's not something that we're able to attain on our own. Love, joy, peace, patience. Those are all fruits of the Spirit. We can't get those on our own. We get those as we draw near to God. Now go down to verse 11. After Paul talks about this contrast of your life but God, in verse 11 he says, therefore, right, because of all that, because of God's sending his son Jesus to save you, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. Right? What Paul's doing is he's addressing two groups in this passage. He's addressing a division that existed. A division that existed based on one's morality. It was a division based on one's ethnicity. It was based on a series of religious laws that separated the monotheistic Old Testament law-abiding Jews from the uh, witchcraft-practicing polytheistic pagan Gentiles. Those are the two groups. That Paul's addressing. And Paul says, listen, Jesus came to bring you together. Jesus came to close the gap between these two groups. And into this context, into this hostile environment, into this division, into this, uh, this society where the Jews would snub their nose at the Gentiles because, oh man, we're, 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 we're way better than you. Okay, first of all, we're Jewish. Second of all, we go to the temple because we can. Right? We're God's chosen people, number three. And so, good luck to you who are not Jews. Into that context, Paul writes there in verse 13 that we just read, but now, but now things are different. But now... Christ Jesus has come. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups, right? These two groups I've just talked about, the Jews and the Gentiles. He's made the two groups one. He's destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity. God's desire in sending Jesus was to reconcile everyone to himself. You know, as I was outside talking with Carlos, I just got, I got the feeling that he, there was that, that wall of division there. Right? That he, he really, he, he, he sensed that, yeah, you're, you know, you're up here because you're like a pastor guy. Like, well, I wasn't a pastor 10 minutes ago, <laughs> right, when I was yelling at you across the street to stay off my property and not do donuts. But I, I, he sensed that. And so at the end of the conversation, one thing I didn't say earlier, he, he talked about how he so much respected and was grateful that I actually would stand there and talk with him. 
that I would listen to his story, that I would listen to his pain, that I would listen to his suffering. And you know what? We have that same person called God that does the same thing, that listens to us, that hears us, that desires to be part of our lives. And it's all because of Christmas. It's all because of Christmas. I want to share with you four, I'll call them the but nows of Christmas. Right? The world used to be like this. Our lives used to be like this. But now because of Christmas, you who were once Christless are now in Christ Jesus. You who were once friendless but now we are members of God's family. We were once hopeless, but now we are promised a glorious future. We were once godless, but now we can call God our Father. That's all because of Christmas. Because of Christmas, we have a Savior. Because of Christmas, we have a family. Because of Christmas, we have hope. Because of Christmas, we have a Father who loves us unconditionally and those four things right there are designed to bring us peace designed to give us peace and comfort and a certainty for our future and and they're meant to provide us peace both in heaven and here on earth you know to these to these citizens of Ephesus these Jews and Gentiles that Paul is writing to he, he writes Jesus came to pay the penalty for the, for the sin but what he needed to clarify at least to the Jews was he came to die for everyone not just Jews not just Gentiles not just religious people but everybody Jesus came to die for me, you, the group of people out in out on the street earlier this morning, everybody, business owners, alcoholics, moms, athletes, criminals, everybody, right? For God so loved the world. Again, I'm pretty simplistic when I read the Bible. To me, world means world. <laughs> and everybody in it. He came to bring peace. How did he do that? Again, by sending Jesus in verse 14, for he himself is our peace. Christ alone is peace personified. Which is why Isaiah right, prophesied centuries ago, prior to the birth of Jesus, 400 years earlier, Isaiah 9, Isaiah wrote, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So here's the question. What do I do with that? What do I do with the fact that Jesus is peace? That God sent his Son to provide me with Love and joy and hope and peace. What's it look like? What's it look like to live a life filled with, that's based on godly peace? Let's continue reading. Verse 18, here in Ephesians 2. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. That's the first way peace plays itself out in our lives. By recognizing and actually putting into practice the unhindered access that we have to God through the Holy Spirit. And I, I, I get this. This isn't earth-shattering news. You're not sitting there thinking, oh, I didn't know that. I can actually pray to God. I get that. Right? It's not earth-shattering. But again, the context of this passage 
makes it earth shattering. Because to the Jews and Gentiles, this was unheard of. Even for the Jews, their only way to access God was to go to the temple and share their pain and suffering with the high priest. It wasn't like they could sit at home, right, in their bedroom and share their thoughts with with God. They had to get up, leave their house, walk down the street, go into the temple, hope the high priest was there, share with him, and then wait because the high priest could only go to God certain times of the year. The high priest couldn't even go to God every day. So then they had to wait for that moment when he could share with them, yeah, I was able to go to God, right? I mean, it was, it was very restrictive. Their access to God was restricted, even as Jews. Well, then you had the Gentiles on the other side who couldn't access God at all as non-Jews, as pagans. Their only, the only way they could access God was to convert to Judaism, which meant changing everything about them, <laughs> both spiritually, emotionally, physically. Right? They had to change everything about them. So this access to God that Paul writes about in that one verse that we take for granted, I think, sometimes, the access that we have to God was unheard of when he wrote these words. I think for us to really understand that, the significance of being able to pray to God is what brings us peace. When we truly understand the significance of that unhindered line to God. The second way that that peace plays out is not just in our prayers that gives us peace, but also understanding that we have each other. Not only do we have God, but God knew that we needed one another, that we could not do this on our own. We were created to be in community. Go to verse 19. Consequently, right, because of what Jesus has done, you are no longer foreigners and strangers. He's writing to the Gentiles but fellow citizens with God's people, right, the Jews, and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Two ways peace plays itself out in our lives. One, through our prayers. And two, through being together. Through living in community. Paul doesn't use the word church there, but I I believe that's exactly what Paul means. He's talking about the church. He's talking about the family of God. And as as I'm out there talking to Carl, you could tell he was hurting. He, He longed for He was longing for, still longs for, a community to be a part of that would accept him, that would love him, that wouldn't judge him because he he said that. He he said that like 10 times, both across the park, both across Erickson and here right in front of me. Kept talking about, the church doesn't judge. The church doesn't judge. I know I can walk in here and not be judged, right? So you can tell he lives in a world that judges and he's looking for a world that doesn't judge. So I invited him. I said, you need, to, you need to come. In fact, come this morning. We're talking about peace, which you're missing. But come. And then when I could tell he wasn't going to come, at that point I was like, well, let me, I'm just going to introduce you to God right now. I, here, here's how it goes. I shared with him the gospel. Now, he wasn't ready in that moment. But I'm praying that he'll, he'll either on his own confess, accept Jesus, or he'll come back and want to know more. But peace is what the world is looking for, and we have, we have it right in front of us, right? We, we have here, I'm going to steal one of these presents again like I did a couple weeks ago. Okay, okay this, this, imagine this represents peace. We have it. 
what we sometimes fail to do is we fail to take the lid off and allow the peace of God to fill us, daily fill us, because it's become so routine. Prayer has become so routine. Going to church has become so routine that we've lost the significance and therefore we've lost the peace and therefore we try to find it on our own through the Hallmark Channel. When peace is right here, we just got to take the lid off and experience the peace that comes from God. So let me just leave you with some takeaways. And I'm going to start, I'm going to go all the way back and start at the very beginning. I'm going to imagine I have 50 Gentiles in the room this morning. Peace starts when you believe it. Peace, start, peace starts by believing. Do you, really, do, do you really believe this stuff? Do you really believe it? And I'm, uh, again, this isn't about believing the Bible. I won't even go there. Okay? I'm not asking you to necessarily believe the Bible. I'm not asking you to believe our doctrinal statement. I just want to know, do you believe God? Do you believe there's a God up there? Do you believe that God sent his son Jesus to come and die for us? Now, that's all in the Bible, but again, let's take, the, let's take the, that out of the equation for a second. Do you just believe that there's a God who unconditionally loves you and sent his son to die for you? Do you personally believe that? Last week when we were in Denver, I had an opportunity to attend the elder meeting at Calvary Inglewood, and we're sitting around the table, and uh, Mark, the, the lead pastor, was sharing how his, his son's tennis coach, he'd been trying to get his, that family to come to uh, church forever, like for years. They finally showed up last Sunday, not last Sunday, the previous Sunday. And he was so excited that they finally shown up. Because he had shared with him, come to church, shared with him God, shared with him what he did. And so this family comes, and right after the service, the dad rushes up. Husband rushes up to Mark and, and looks at him and says, Okay, I knew you were a pastor, and I knew you like read the Bible and pray and stuff, but you really believe this, don't you? And it was because of the passion that Mark was preaching with. It was the passion of the gospel that came out. And so at that point, the guy realized, hey, it's not just about the Bible. It's not just about church. It's about this gospel of Jesus Christ. And this guy on the stage, he really believes it. And so he's willing to actually entertain more about Jesus because of the passion, because of the honest belief. And so that's where it begins. Peace begins when we believe it, not just practice it necessarily, right? Be, be religious, like Carlos told me, but we actually believe it. It's not just a religion. You've heard this phrase probably, right? Not just a religion relationship. It's so true. So true. Secondly, after we believe it, then we need to receive it. We need to receive it. And probably the majority in this room, you have received it. You've placed your faith in Jesus, the Prince of Peace. But then maybe here's the final one where we miss the mark and where peace goes off the rails. We need to live like it. We need to live like we believe it. We need to live like we've received it. As God's children, we have an amazing privilege to pray to God. We have an amazing privilege to be together, to gather together and sing and study God's word and encourage and help one another and love one another. But with that privilege comes an unheard of, <laughs> a, a scary responsibility. A responsibility to live in harmony with one another. To live in harmony, as, as Paul wrote about to the Ephesians, to the people of Ephesus. Jesus came to bring unity, to abolish division, to get rid of hostility, to bring together, to, as, as, he, as he writes there, right, in verse, uh, verse 14. Right, for himself is our peace who has made the two groups one. He's destroyed the barrier. 
So we need to live in harmony. And as it also talks about in Scripture, the world will see that. The world will know us by our love. Next Sunday, Christmas, we're coming together as four churches. Not because it's convenient. Not because everybody wanted to have, you know, a Sunday, Christmas Sunday in here. And there was only, you know, it didn't fit time. It fit time. No. We're coming together and inviting the world. Come and be a part. Come and experience the love of God. So, live in harmony with one another and, and our hearts must break for those outside. Our, heart, our hearts must break for our neighbors. Our hearts must break for strangers that we encounter. I mean, this morning was the most, it was the most inconvenient time on the planet for me to have that conversation with Carlos. He's talking to me and I'm thinking, man, I got a message to do and I got a, you know, I got, I got a band practice in, I got some, you know, I got stuff to do. I don't got time to talk to you. And as I'm, as that is worn around in my head, God's saying, you got all the time, you got all the time in the world right here because this is where you need to be. You need to be right here, right now, present in this guy's life. So let's commit ourselves this Christmas and let's commit ourselves as we go into 2023 to be followers of Jesus that love one another and are present in the lives of those that don't know Jesus. So that we can be like the angels, right, in Luke 2.14 who proclaimed glory to God in the highest heaven. Right, let's proclaim that vertically. Let's give glory to God. And then let's also wish peace to those whom Jesus came to die for. Those that need to know Jesus. Let me pray. Oh God, I, I, Lord, I, I thank you for that, that interruption this morning. Lord, that was such a huge reminder of why we're here. That we're not here for our own convenience. That we're not here for our own comfort. But we're here as living testimonies of your grace. Living testimonies of your unconditional love. Living examples of your forgiveness. God, my prayer is that those, those inter- kind of interruptions would continue. God, that you would use Parkside to be a loving community that, that, that reaches out, that people see and they want to come and be a part of, not because of anything we've done, but because of what you've done. So God, I just, I just thank you for Christmas. I thank you for sending your son Jesus to come and to love us. God, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.